women are spending 22% of their time on their top priority activities, and men are only at 18%. So women are more concentrated on their top priority activities than men are. One of the curses of to-do lists is that people kind of just keep carrying stuff forward and carrying stuff forward and carrying stuff forward, which means suddenly you're working on things that have got zero importance, but they're just things that you want to be able to tick off and say that you've done. Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal lives by creating better businesses. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system. Today's guest is the inventor of the time coder device. He has collected 500,000 hours of real-time data on productivity and is the author of three books, including The Poetic Path to Getting More Done. Today, he's going to share with us the astounding findings in his 34 years of scientific research and data about the time use difference between men and women at work, and he's going to reveal who is more productive and why. Mark Elwood is an internationally known productivity consultant from Toronto, Canada, who works with people from all around the world. Welcome to the show, Mark. Great to have you here. Hi, Deborah. Nice to be here. So we've just been having a bit of a chat, as I always do with my guests before you come onto the podcast, and you have got quite an interesting backstory, don't you? So why don't you start by telling us a bit about how you got into what you're doing today? I'm a productivity consultant. I have an electronic device that people use for tracking how they spend their time. And when you go way, way back, my grounding in productivity started when I was a little paper boy. I don't know if people have paper routes anymore, but when I was young, they did. And so I wanted to finish delivering my papers as quickly as I could. So I just got these ideas about being productive. The first was the use of technology. Well, I bought a wagon. A lot easier to pull a wagon behind you than carrying those heavy bags on your shoulders. The next thing I did, it was, you know, I could fold the papers up and throw them. Now there's a bit of a trick to that. I could probably still do it. But the thing <laughs> is, how much time do you spend folding the papers and how many steps do you save by walking up to someone's door or, or being able to throw it up on their porch or whatever? So it's a little bit of a calculation there. Another calculation you make is, this is sort of logistics. Think of pulling this wagon up the street on one side. Okay, do I take three papers to the other side of the street or do I move up farther? So there's a little bit of calculation determining how to plot out the route to minimize the number of steps. Here's a third one, blocking or batching your tasks. So you had to go and collect every single week from your customers. And I thought, hmm, I got 120 customers. Maybe if I split the route in half, I'll go to half of the route for two weeks and then the other half of the uh, collect for two weeks and then the other half of the route and collect for two weeks. So really, I was only going to 60 every week, but then the other 60 on the other weeks. There was one last thing I might have done. People had the option to pay from the office. They could send a check in or something like that. The thing there is that would have saved me collecting time but you don't get as many tips because when you go and collect door to door, people give you tips. So all these things, oh yeah, sorry, one other, the last one. On the weekends, the two, the, the newspapers came separately from an insert, kind of a color insert, and you had to put the two of them together. So I would sit there, and this is pure time in motion, figuring out how to get those inserts in the paper as fast as possible. So all those were ways that I got my grounding and thinking about productivity, about how to be more efficient, about how to get stuff done. And I guess that's where it all started as a paper boy. I love it. And I'm really keen to find out. So from when you started to when you finished, how much did you shave off the time? Oh, gosh. Well, I wasn't measuring it back then. And that came later. And so when I was working in a big corporation, like everybody, I experienced meetings that were late. And I, that really frustrated me because I was a guy who liked to be on time. 
And so I was looking around thinking, how much, you know, how late were you and his time? And if we could add that up or maybe we could measure it or we have a device. And so the aha moment happened where I thought of inventing a small electronic device to track all your time, not just on meetings, but on paperwork or sales calls or marketing projects or whatever. So I invented an electronic device. This is the second version called the time quarter. So it's a small device that we program with different activities. And every time you begin a different activity, you just press one button. And so I'm selling, I'll press button number A, I'm traveling, I'll press button B and so on. So since 1990, I've been lending out my stock. I've got about 400 of these. I've been lending them out to corporations where people can use them to track how they spend their time. Excellent. Okay. And I know you've been gathering all that data as well as you've been working with those companies. What has been the most interesting thing you've found out from tracking all those different times? I guess a macro conclusion would be that people don't get the time they want to spend on their highest priority activities. And they get a, a lot of time gets consumed by non-priority activities, administrative tasks. You know, I started in 1990 before voicemail, uh, if people know what that is, before email, before the internet, before there were some laptops and certainly before websites. And we've had all those things developed since people are spending the same amount of time as they used to on administrative tasks today. So as we continue to have knowledge workers, which is my area, those knowledge workers are always burdened by administrative tasks. And that's fascinating, isn't it? Because we were promised with all this technology, things were going to become a whole lot easier. We could work from anywhere. We wouldn't have all this stuff to do. And yet it hasn't changed. Correct. And I saw a, a video recently, some guy talking to his computer and using AI to book sales meetings and so on. And it all sounded very smart. But I saw that some, same or a similar video back in 1990. Here's the wonderful world of the future. And listen, that future has come and it's terrific and we use technology. However, we have to deal with the side effects and the spinoffs like, well, I've measured time spent on unnecessary email. It's 3.4 hours per week. People talk about meetings and so on and so forth. So there's, I don't call it waste of time, but it's non-value added time. More recently, I looked at my database and I was intrigued to look at differences between men and women at work. And so I, that's the subject of my most recent research. Mm, so tell me a little bit about that. Differences between men and women, that might be fascinating. You can actually start with men and differences at home. So I'm part of the, a member of the International Association of Time Use Research. And lots of countries, particularly in the West, as well as Australia, New Zealand, Japan, but Western Europe tends to, or not tends, they run a lot of these time use studies. And you call people up on the phone and ask them what they did yesterday, or you ask them to fill out a diary. My, I like to think my approach is a little better, but they're doing thousands of these things. So there's a lot of time use research out there. And one of the consistent trends is that women spend more time on household tasks than men, unpaid work. So it's shopping and childcare and cooking and cleaning. And in Canada, for instance, and these are similar in other countries, women spend about 3.6 hours per day on that and men about 2.1 hours, so it's an hour and a half difference. So women continue to do more of these domestic tasks. And I thought, well, what does the picture look like at work? I've got a lot of data, so maybe I can see, are there similar uh, trends in the workplace? Because that's pretty big as well. So that's where I started diving into. Right. So tell me what happens in the workplace then. First thing, of course, I had to figure out who is a men and, men and women. I don't get that many demographic details from my clients. It's you know, this type of employee in that city, but they don't tell me ages and things. So I had to go through and think, okay, Susan, that's a woman. Jim, that's a man. Kelly, not sure. So I split the database in two. And basically, looking at time use differences, the major conclusion I came to is that women are better at managing their time at work than men. And there are four major findings. So the first finding is women spend fewer hours at work than men. So 
these are knowledge workers. So I'm not looking too much at construction workers or, or uh, people changing sheets in a hotel or whatever, but it's knowledge workers. So men are about 48 hours per week and women are about 45. Now that includes some personal time because they're at the workplace and you know, you're there. And so personal time is included, which is only about three hours per week. So men are working longer hours than women. Why is that? Well, we just talked about who's taking care of all those domestic duties. Who's going to get home, take care of the kids and shop and uh, prepare dinner and so on. So that was the first of the four major findings uh, that indicated women are better at managing their time than men. Okay, interesting. So what else? What else did you find out? Lesson one. So if you read time management literature, they tell you to spend your time on important tasks. And there's this well-known Eisenhower matrix, which is the important urgent matrix. It's two by two. We, we use it a lot with my clients, yeah. Yeah, don't spend all your time on urgent stuff, spend on important. Now, I think that's a particularly great diagnostic tool to see where all that time is going. It's harder to use as a planning tool because you don't know what urgent things are going to happen this afternoon. You can't plan for those customer complaints or the roof caving in or whatever. But nonetheless, many of the time management experts, and me too, ask us to spend our time on quadrant two, which is important and non-urgent activities. But it's rarely defined as to what those are. And I thought, well, let's look through the literature. And I couldn't find a whole lot. Cubby talked about relationship building a little bit, but I thought maybe we could map this. So interestingly, in my time studies, I always ask people in advance four questions. And one of them is, what are the most important things you need to do in your job? You could say, well, salespeople should be selling. Well, really? Some of them say they should be providing customer service. Some, they say they should be processing orders or whatever. But if you look at the answers to my question, salespeople will say they're supposed to be prospecting and selling. Managers are supposed to be managing, leading, directing, and coaching. So if those are those important activities that can map those, then we can see, are they spending their time uh, on those activities or not. So it turns out overall, if you look at across thousands of people in my database, the average time spent on top priority activities is only 20%. Now I've reported on salespeople who are at 23%, but that's outside sales reps. If you add in inside, it's a little higher. But if you look at managers and construction supervisors and customer reps and so on, the average is 20%. That's it. You can't get too much higher. Some people can, but you can't get to 80%. So when you look at the differences between men and women, women are spending 22% of their time on their top priority activities, and men are only at 18%. So women are more concentrated on their top priority activities than men are. Interesting. And it's actually really cool to hear that because I know that when I work with my clients and I work with leadership teams, I always say to them that they should really be spending 20% of their time doing that non-urgent but important stuff. That's their rocks. That's the stuff that's going to move the needle. So interesting to see that is about what it comes out at as well in reality. <laughs> well, now you can use that for your... Now, some people talk about the 2080 rule. This is not that. That was the idea that a small number of activities create a large number of results. If you do nothing at all on that 20%, you'll get zero results. So you could argue that those 20% are responsible for 100% of result, results. But within that, you've got some that are more important and, and create greater sales, for instance, for sales reps. But 20% on top priority activities. You can get that higher. So it's some of my data shows that you can get that up to 30%. That's about an extra hour per day. And so that's a possibility for some people. And that must make a huge difference, right? That extra 10% would probably add a huge amount to the bottom line in terms of doing more of those important things. Exactly. So that's the second finding. The third one is duration. So when you're pushing buttons on the time quarter device, we're getting a sense of frequency. How frequent are you doing things? And overall, the average is about every 18 minutes or so. There are long meetings, but there are shorter customer calls and so on. Well, Men are at 22 minutes and women are at 16. So they're getting things done faster than men. 
So that suggests as well that they're managing their time well. And then the final finding is one that most time studies don't look at, which is ideal time. So when I started, I thought, well, I don't have any data. So how, what am I going to compare it to? I need some benchmarks. So I asked people to give me where they ideally think they should spend their time. And so ever since I've, I've been gathering that. So we can look at the ideal profiles and see how close people are to that. And when you look at that by individual activity, you can create a sort of a proxy for, pro uh, for productivity. So the famous example is the wisdom of the crowd, the, the, the jars in the, or sorry, the, the uh, number of jelly beans in a jar. If you have a whole bunch of people, guess how many jelly beans there are in the jar. If you average their results, that will be pretty close to the actual number. Similarly, if you average everybody's ideal expectations, that becomes then a best practice. And so if you look at how close you are on individual activities, maybe you want to spend your five hours a week selling, but you're only at four weeks, four hours. If you think you should be managing for six hours a week and you're at eight, well, that's close too. You're over a little bit. So going through the database and going through individual profiles we can look at how close people are to their ideal profiles across a number of activities. You can add up the sum of the differences. Turns out, long explanation, that men are, the, the proxy number is 45 hours per week, you could say, but it's all the addition, adding a whole bunch of individual activities. And women are about 45 hours per week. So a difference, actually, sorry, let me correct that, 45 and 42. So there's a difference of three hours. So women are closer to their ideal profile by about three hours per week than men. So that's the fourth of the findings that led me to conclude that women are doing a better job of managing their time than men. I'm very pleased to hear that. <laughs> that is really fascinating. What? So do you think it's because they have a lot more stuff on that they have to be more organized? I've always wondered what the sort of, because I'm, I'm super organized. I do get a lot of stuff done. Some people say to me, I don't know how you do it, but it's just, well, I just have to. So I get on with it. <laughs> so I'm holding up the data and saying, this is the reality. This is what's going on. So you've asked, well, why is that? So I've got three ideas and it, it's hard to make those connections. But nonetheless, the first is the one that I kind of hinted at. Women who are more responsible for those domestic tasks got to get home and take care of the kids. So they better be more efficient at work and you know, find time to get things done during that shorter work week of about three hours shorter per week. The second is we just don't do enough training. And so where do you get your training? It's quite possible that those women who are often mothers are learning some skills in the household that they can then translate to the workplace. Women will tell you it's a busy, complex job being a mother, cooking those meals, taking care of kids and so on. And so perhaps... Those skills, as I said, are transferable more so than men who may not have had that kind of experience. But if we could train people, and there's some evidence that training makes a difference, then everyone would be better. The third and much more tenuous conclusion or, or a connection is possible brain differences. The data here is not that solid about differences between men and women, cognitive differences, and so on. I looked around, and I thought, nah, maybe I'll just steer clear of that one. But if there are brain differences, those might be contributing factors as well. I'll leave someone else to come up with that data. That's great. Hey, I'm just really interested. You've been doing this for a long time now. I mean, you know, started back in 19, kind of 1989, 1990. Has anything changed in that time period? Like, have you seen any significant shifts? Because in theory, we're told that, you know, that men are helping out more at home, that there's less of a distinction between roles, that we have you know, lots of, it's not just males and females, there's a whole kind of um, gender fluid diversity. I'm just wondering, has, has the data changed in, in that time or not really? Yes. If you go to these time use conferences, you'll find there is a kind of a catch up, so to speak. And look, we go, in, go back a couple of hundred years, everybody's working equally. I mean, women might have been more in the household, men were more out in the fields, farming and so on. But if you think about more recent, the last 70 or 80 years, 
there was a time when women stayed at home all the time in since maybe World War II or so, and that women, men were out working. So women were doing all the child care. But when women started to enter the workforce, we did see those changes. And so now you get more equal sharing of tasks at home where men are starting to catch up and play, play, play a greater role in terms of household management, child care, elder care, and so on. So yes, those are changing right. to some degree. Some degree. I suppose that, that might also mean that they, that might change the, the other statistics as well in terms of the amount of time they spend at work and how effective they become. Yes, uh, we'll see. Time use doesn't change that fast. Um, and so, you know, I've looked at administrative time. And back in 1990, it was 25% of the week. And today it's 25% of the week. I, I've concluded that you could take knowledge work and you could outsource it to another country. You could automate it. Or now you could replace it with AI. Well, okay. But as long as you have people doing knowledge work at some point in the future, I'm convinced that they will convinced that they will continue to be burdened by administrative time. And so we can reduce that administrative time and find ways to spend more time on their high priority tasks. That's how to get people more productive. You mentioned changes since then. We've had all kinds of technological changes. Voicemail, email, laptops, you know, the internet, smartphones, and so on. And one of the things that those do is they create terrific productivity advantages, but they also come with unexpected spin-offs and side effects. So I remember, you know, I used to do spreadsheets when I started my career by hand. And when we got computers, wow, that made that easier. But somebody just asked for instead of one promotion plan, you do three different versions at 5%, 10 and 15% growth. So we're just doing more. We've also eliminated administrative help. Not many people have assistants or secretaries. They're doing all that work themselves. And so if you can delegate that to people, the non-value added work, that's one way to become more productive. Yeah. It's one of the things I actually teach my clients is around delegate and elevate, making sure that you're doing the work where you really love and are great at and adds the most value and try to delegate. And as you said, there's different ways of doing that. It could be outsourcing it. It could be somebody else in the team. It could be automating it. It could be just completely stopping it. But it's not as easy as it sounds at times. It's about really being very clear. So I'm really interested to find out in terms of the productivity studies. I, mean, I knew this went on in the, when I did my degree back in the yeah, early 80s, we talked about the whole time management stuff. What's, how does it work in business and what benefits do the businesses get from actually doing it? Uh, from, from my studies or time management in general? No, from the time management in general. So, I mean, I love the idea of having a device that makes it nice and easy to capture it. But then, then what? So now you've got all this information. So what? Companies are interested in becoming more productive, although that sometimes doesn't take front and center. They're thinking about automating a plant or an acquisition or something. But I believe that if you have a lot of people, then those people can make a big difference. And largely it's kind of been overlooked because, well, they'll work long hours and people do. They choose to work long hours for the same amount of pay. And so companies benefit from that because they get this sort of free labor in, in a sense. And, but going along with that is burnout and turnover and stress and so on. It's interesting because stress was a popular topic in the 80s and 90s. It kind of quietened down, but then it's, it's come to rear its ugly head again. And I think stress is becoming closer to us. Just looking on social media, all the yelling and ranting is creating grief for people. The, the kinds of things in the workplace, think of the pandemic and working from home and so on, that, that was really close to people. And so they struggled with that. And now, you know, do I go into the office to work or do I work from home? I don't see my boss and so on. So that creates a, a whole new series of stresses. So those are there and they've reared their ugly head. And so again, does the corporation care or not? And lots maybe don't as much, but others have introduced work-life balance practices. So whether it's a shorter week or allowing people to leave early on Fridays or flex time, or of course, the one that's most popular now is work from home. And so allowing people the flexibility to work from home 
now that we figure out how to do that is a terrific, it has terrific productivity advantages, but we're going to be careful about it as well because now people are isolated. They never meet their boss and so on. So but you ask what companies can do, if you understand that all of your sales reps are being burdened by this administrative work or processing or spending all their time, you know, updating client information and so on. There's a re-engineering opportunity there. Let's take that task and find ways to minimize the time spent on it so that people are spending their time on their higher priority tasks and not on these lower ones. So that's what organizations can do. We already talked about bringing, you know, using assistance. And so sometimes that's outsourcing. And we've seen that with customer service, right? When you call an organization, maybe it's somebody who's being paid a little less than the customer service rep because you've outsourced it to an area where the labor rates are less expensive. And so there's pros and cons to that as well. I mentioned training. That's another thing that organizations can do. And whether it's training in time management or communication skills or leadership or meeting management or writing skills, like all of those should happen. And people coming out of university or high school may not have all those skills. So I think organizations need to continue to invest in training and development, particularly on soft skills, so that their employees are keen to, to stay and not leave to go somewhere else <clears throat> where they can get that kind of help. Okay. And so just in terms of where you get started, so you think you might have a productivity issue, um, potentially the whole working from home thing has changed the dynamics and whatnot. What are the, what are the kind of the, the key indicators that there might be some time loss in the business, I suppose? What are the, the, the red flags that make you go, mm, this is not quite right? <laughs> Sometimes people talk about wasted time at work. And I'm a little cautious about that because because I think, that, so my philosophy, and I think everyone should be that employees care about their jobs. They want to do a good job. They want work that's of value. And so if they're sitting around or grumbling or whatever, maybe you're not giving them work of value or you keep changing directions on them. Changing directions seems to happen a lot. I was... um intrigued recently by a couple of rejection letters that I got. Oh, sorry, we're not ready to go ahead yet. It's, and they had come to me originally, but it's companies not making up their minds about which direction they could head in. So organizations could do a better job of being really clear about this is direction we're heading in, in terms of growth and changes and so on, and provide training to employees. So, okay, so where are those problems you asked about? You know, what are the red flags? So there is wasted time, although I'm really cautious about that. Sometimes it's the individual, all right, they're shopping on Amazon or something while they're at work, but that's not a huge amount. What you find is meetings that take a long time that where decisions aren't being made. I've got a, a, a simple definition for why meetings should be held. It's dead simple. Meetings should be held so that stakeholders can make decisions that lead to action. Anything else is not needed. You don't need to upgrade, update people. You don't need to arrange for whatever. You need to make decisions that lead to action. Now, so use other media to, to do some of the other things like update people and send them reports and so on. So you, you know, what are the indicators? Long meetings would be an indicator stress levels that go up and that's measured in different ways. Physical stress or behavioral stress, people are reacting to stuff and, and having trouble. Turnover could be one. Uh, employees are leaving the organization. Why is that? It's because they're not happy with what they're doing. So organizations need to be sensitive to all this. If you're not doing a time study, another is to do an employee satisfaction study and find out, are we on track to where we want to be or are there levels of dissatisfaction. Either way, you're diagnosing what's going on out there. And just back to the time thing, by the way, during COVID, there were a whole bunch of companies that, that came up that were doing employee monitoring because everyone's at home. And employees didn't like that. When I do my studies, they're completely anonymous. I never give back names of individuals to the 
to the client. And so employees can go, oh, good. Somebody's listened to me about how I spend my time and all this non-value added time. Great. And so we got an amazing participation rate of 94%. That's a little bit of bragging, but you, anyone can achieve that if you tell people what the objectives of your program are uh, or is and what the objectives are. Or if you make it easy, make it anonymous, listen to employees. And when you're doing that, then those improvements start to become fairly obvious. But that COVID monitoring stuff, people didn't like it at all. The second thing about that is companies said, we don't care about how they spend their time. We just care about what they get done. And my response to that would be, sure, when you run a 100 meter race, really you mostly care about how many seconds it took to run the race. But you should also care about how many steps per second, about gait, about heart rate, about oxygen intake. Those are the diagnostic tools. And similarly, time use can be a diagnostic tool to understand performance. And if people are getting dragged down by all those forms they got to fill out, that's a, a diagnostic that organizations need to be sensitive to. There you go. No, I love it. Love it. Well, speaking the same language, I, I, we you use a thing called level 10 meetings and they're all about basically cutting the crap and getting on with the what really needs to happen and getting actions out of it. And I always say to my clients, it's like, you know, when you say to, to you, uh, when you talk to your teams, it's like, we don't really care what you're doing. We don't need updates. If you're on track, you're achieving what you need to do. You're feeling happy. This meeting is about what's the next step. What do we need to do? What are the stuff that's stopping us from getting there? And it always leads to actions, seven days sort of to-do items. So yeah, I, I'm completely on the same page there. And I understand the whole COVID thing because I think it felt more like a big brother rather than a trying to help you. I think that's the challenge. And I know when I work with sales teams, CRM can sometimes have the same kind of, if it's, put, if it's positioned incorrectly, people don't understand the benefit of it. They see it as being big brother tracking what you're doing. Whereas I say, no, CRM is about making your job easier. It's about facilitating um, the way that you work to actually get the best results. It, I, it's not about monitoring what you're doing. So it's really about people understanding, as you said, it's, it's clarity from the leaders to say, hey, this is why we're doing it. And this is the benefit to you, as opposed to we're here to, to stop watching you and see what you're doing. So in terms of people listening into this, what would you recommend they could do if they feel they might have potentially some burnout or some in, in um, efficiencies or any of those sort of time productivity issues? Well, on the burnout, you know, I did a stress management workshop recently. And the thing about burnout is it's not always connected. Yeah, I play squash and if I run into the wall, it hurts and I can directly connect that. But the boss yelled at you a week ago and today you've got a headache or a stomach ache or something. And so those are stress symptoms. Sometimes it's not always direct. But if something's going on in a sort of queer way with your body, or you're not feeling right, or you're behaving strangely or whatever, uh, something's not right. You kind of have to say to yourself, what are those stress factors? Might've been a death in the family. Might've been a, a teenager who's misbehaving. Might've been your boss yelling at you. So you kind of have to look at those and find out what those are. So some self-assessment on stress makes sense. You can also assess yourself. You don't have to do one of my time studies, just trying to understand your own productivity and, and write something down or keep a diary or do it electronically or whatever, but just try and assess yourself now and then to see where you are. That's the first step. And then uh, you can start to make some improvements after that. So you're probably curious about what those might be. So I'm a, a big fan of daily planning. You probably are as well, a to-do list. And here's my magic tip for filling out your to-do list. Start with a blank slate, nothing on your to-do list at all. No meetings, no phone calls, nothing. And ask yourself this question. If I had nothing to do today, what would I do to affect my results a month from now? I'll repeat that. If I had nothing to do today, what would I do to affect my results a month from now? You'll write down the items you can complete. So I need to hire a new employee. Well, I can't do that today, but I can go through the resumes or I can post the job on a job board or so on. And so those are your priorities, the ones we talked about earlier. And so that goes first on your to-do to -do list and those need to get done first. And people go, okay, after I've done everything else. No, 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 plan for those first 
and set out some time for those. Then fill in all the other stuff on your to-do list. And that should be, as we said earlier, at least 20% of your time on those high priority tasks. That's a way of thinking about your to-do list and what's important for you. Just writing a few notes here. That's great. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, that's really important. I think that uh, one of the curses of to-do lists is that people kind of just keep carrying stuff forward and carrying stuff forward and carrying stuff forward, which means suddenly you're working on things that have got zero importance, but they're just things that you want to be able to tick off and say that you've done rather than actually the things that will make a difference in the future. Where am I delaying all these things and why am I delaying? So yeah. that's worth looking into. And sometimes you get to a point where, you know, the things that are on there just are no longer important. You know, things change and it's no longer actually something you should be doing. So I love the idea of starting completely with a blank page. Any other tips or pointers? Meetings come a lot. And, you know, and, and email, I'll give you a couple of notes. People are, oh, meetings. Oh, I got all these meetings. Work is collaborative. There are very few people that work independently, maybe fine artists, maybe a farmer out in the fields, but most of us work in collaborative organizations, even solo entrepreneurs. And some of those are listening. Even those people work collaboratively. And so meetings are not evil and they can work well. So my philosophy on meetings is this. Everybody who attends a meeting has the right and the responsibility to improve the dynamics of the meeting. You may not be able to be the final person who makes a decision, but you can be, or anyone can be, the person who says, we seem to be off track. Can we get back on track? Or can we get an agenda for this? Or ah, it's five minutes late. Can we start on time? Nobody, but nobody ever got fired for trying to improve the dynamics of a meeting. And so... Everyone can take responsibility for that and focus on, are we heading towards a decision? And maybe we're floundering a little bit. Someone could say, gee whiz, maybe a couple of us need to take this offline and explore this or do some more research or something. Because if the meeting manager doesn't do that, then you can do that and see what happens. Yeah. You're, again, you're speaking my language. I have a, all of my teams actually have to score their meetings every time they run one. And, and with the rule is that, you know, a meeting starts at 10. Every meeting is perfect before you get started. And you only take points off when things go wrong. And I remember seeing this, this one, one team's results coming through every week. And all of them were kind of an eight or a nine, apart from one person who was a six all the time. So I picked up the phone. And I said to her, hey, you know, what's going on? Why, why is this meeting a six? And everybody else thinks it's an eight or a nine. She said, well, you know, the boys, they keep going off track. And the boys, they keep doing this. And the boys, they keep doing that. I said, um, are you in this meeting? She said, yes. I said, so what are you doing about it? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're, you're part of this meeting. It's your responsibility to actually go, hey, this isn't working for me. Or this is, you know, we're going off track here. You have to take responsibility and make that meeting a 10. That's what you're there for. It's like, oh, okay. And it just turned it on its head. She was much, much more comfortable with rating everything down than actually putting her hand up and doing something about it. <laughs> we, we are of the same mind about that. And I, I'll go to things and say, gosh, let's get started. And the idea is for starting on time, do something minor, go over the agenda or introduce each other or give an update or something like that. So that when people arrive, they know they're late, but indeed. Anyone can do that, not just the meeting manager. Okay. You also mentioned something about emails. So what's your tip around emails? <laughs> I do a little exercise sometimes. I say, can I just do a little survey here? There are a lot of bad drivers out there, vehicle drivers. And can we just do a survey? How many bad drivers are out there? And I go around the room and, you know, 80%, 20%, this, that, whatever. If you do that survey, I enjoy, I invite people to try it sometimes. The average is about 33% where I am. So about a third of drivers are bad drivers. And then I go, would all the bad drivers please stand up? And nobody does. Well, we'll attribute bad behavior to others. And we always don't always take responsibility ourselves. Ah, email, <laughs> right? It's us. It's not someone else. There's no evil person down in the basement sending out emails all day. It's all of us. We all need to take responsibility. If you send out one email and copy 20 people, you've sent out 20 emails. And my data is showing that unnecessary email to the degree that people thought that measured themselves is 3.4 hours per week. That's massive. And it will save us. So what do you do there? Uh, first, be aware that we're all responsible. 
Um, take yourself off email distribution lists. Tell people that you don't need to be copied. Oh, I need to know what's going on. No, you don't. Uh, you will when it's something important. And, and write brief emails. Don't tell stories through emails. Pick up the phone instead. Don't try and correct someone's behavior through emails. That never works. So use the right medium when you have different media available to you, phone, meeting in person, whatever. Keep your emails short, one idea, one paragraph, and uh, take responsibility. And don't just accuse everyone else of sending out all these emails. <laughs> but nobody ever stands up. I get it completely. <laughs> hey, Mark, it, it's, that's, that's fascinating. I'm, I'm re I must admit, I, when I first saw your brief come through and you wanted to be on the podcast, I was like, oh, my God, this sounds really fascinating. It has been. Seriously, um, it's been an absolute pleasure to kind of find out more. I can see the benefits of actually you know, taking the time to work out where you're spending your time, what effect it has on the business, and also, you know, making sure we get the most out of each day. So they, but thank you very much for that. You've obviously got a website, getmoredone.com, which is uh, where you can find all the tips and tools and things. And you've also got a book, The Poetic Path to Getting More Done, which I believe is a, a book of poems. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, well, our book of poems are like productivity, time, meeting management, goal setting. I sometimes use them in workshops. So you can call me if you want one of those. It's not on Amazon anymore, but I, I or I can send you one of the poems. Goal setting is a poem. I would, I would love one of those books. I think that sounds absolutely fascinating. So I'll definitely go on one of those. But if anybody else wants to get hold of one, I guess if you get to go to getmoredone.com, they'll be able to find you, get in contact with you both for the consulting work, but also for books and any tips and tools, right? You bet. Absolutely. Well, hey, look, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. I'm really excited to hear that women get more done, but, <laughs> but, but, but we're working on everybody. I mean, I think that's the, the thing, right? Training, training can actually help everybody improve um, and understanding where you've got those issues obviously is the first step towards that. So thank you, Mark. Your time is worth it. <laughs> Indeed. Well, thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and um, we will keep in contact. Thank you.